Hello and welcome to this podcast on fluid therapy. This podcast has been written to give an introduction to the complex world of fluid prescribing and should help you with the tutorials you will get as part of your anaesthetic attachment, as well as in your future careers. By the end of this podcast, you should be able to describe the compartment model of fluids, describe the basic daily requirement for fluids and electrolytes, describe how you would assess fluid status, understand the differences between resuscitation fluids, replacement fluids and maintenance fluids, and understand the basics of safe fluid prescribing. The prescribing of fluid is something that is done very poorly throughout the hospital. Most patients get too much of the wrong kind of fluid at the wrong time, and this is a recognised cause of harm to our patients. As junior doctors, it often falls to you to prescribe the fluids on the ward, and you are therefore best placed to change this. The first and most important thing to understand is that for almost everybody, the best way to take fluids is to take them orally. We have evolved to drink and we have a feedback loop which makes us thirsty when we need fluids and stops us drinking when we've had enough. This is the best way of getting your patients the correct amount of fluids and luckily for you as doctors, this approach also means less work. You just should ensure that everyone who can drink is allowed to drink and encouraged to drink. This can be done by minimising fasting times, ensuring water is easily within reach and providing assistance to those who can't drink for themselves. It might be as simple as putting a straw into a glass of water. The first question you should always ask yourself when prescribing fluids is, does this patient need IV fluids? Unfortunately, in some cases, the oral route is not an option. It's therefore important that you understand the basic daily requirements of fluids and electrolytes and how to assess the fluid status of a patient. This will allow you to write an individual prescription for an individual patient. We will now go on to look at the classic compartment model of fluids. The total body water is approximately 60% of the total body weight. This means that a 70 kilogram man would contain roughly 42 litres of water. Classically, we divide the fluid in the body into two main compartments, the intracellular fluid, which makes up two thirds of the volume, and the extracellular fluid, which makes up a third. We then subdivide the extracellular into the interstitial fluid, which makes up three quarters, and the plasma, which makes up a quarter. You can also see from the diagram that there is the transcellular fluid, although this is so small that for our practices, it can be ignored. Out of these, the main compartment that you can influence is the plasma compartment, which as we can see is the smallest compartment. This is one of the things that makes managing fluids so difficult. Now that we know about the total volume of fluid in the body, we need to think about the ways we get fluid in and lose fluid and how this changes in disease states. In a 24 hour period, a 75 kilogram man will lose 1500 mils of fluid in his urine, 200 mils of fluid in his faeces, 400 mils of fluid in his sweat, and 400 mils from his respiratory tract. The sweat and respiratory losses are known as the insensible losses as we can't easily measure them. To balance this out, he will need to take in 1500 mils by drinking, 750 mils from eating and 250 mils from his metabolism. The fluid produced by the metabolism um, comes from the respiration um, and the water produced by the mitochondria during the electron transfer chain. We can see from this that different disease states would affect our fluid balance in different ways and we can help our patients to compensate for this. For example, a patient with viral gastro gastroenteritis will have a higher GI, sweat and respiratory loss and will have a much lower intake of both fluids and diet. As you can probably see by now, the prescribing of fluids is far from simple. It's therefore vital that you know and examine the patient before prescribing fluid for them. When we assess the patient for fluid status, we need to look at their observation charts for their heart rate and their blood pressure. 
We need to look at their fluid chart for their ins and outs over the day and also their cumulative fluid balance over several days. We then need to look at the patient themselves. Do they feel warm or cool? What's their skin turgor like? Do their mucous membranes look dry or moist? Do they have any peripheral or pulmonary edema? Having done this, you then need to go and look at the blood results, uh, in particular the sodium, potassium and the renal function. Finally, we need to consider any pathology affecting the patient. For example, do they have heart failure, which would make them more prone to fluid overload? Or do they have gastroenteritis, meaning that we need to give them a little bit more fluid to keep up with their requirements? Having assessed the patient, we need to decide whether they need replacement fluid, maintenance fluid or resuscitation fluid. If you think that your patient is euvolemic, that's to say you think their fluid balance is about right, then they need maintenance fluids only. If your patient has signs of dehydration, then they will need some extra fluid in addition to their daily fluids so they don't fall behind. Finally, if your patient is hypotensive and shocked, then they need fast resuscitation fluids. We will now talk about the prescribing of maintenance fluids. The surgical 2.5 litres of Hartman's per day is not correct for a number of different reasons. Firstly, this is too much fluid for anybody under 75 kilograms. Secondly, this is too much sodium and chloride for anybody short of an elephant. And thirdly, this is not nearly enough potassium. A rough guide to the daily requirements of a patient is 30 mils per kilo per 24 hours of fluid, one millimole per kilo per 24 hours of sodium, and the same again for potassium and chloride. This means that a 70 kilogram person would require 2,100 ml of fluid and 70 millimoles of sodium, potassium and chloride. Now that we know the daily requirements of a healthy patient, we need to have a think about how we give it to them. Now that we know the daily requirements for a healthy patient, we need to have a think about how we give it to them. Fluids can be split into two categories, crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloids are the most commonly prescribed fluids and they are defined as a solution which contains electrolytes and non-electrolytes which can diffuse across a selectively permeable membrane. Examples of these would be 5% dextrose, 0.9% saline and Hartmann's. Colloids are solutions containing larger molecules which cannot diffuse across a selectively permeable membrane. In theory, these larger molecules stay in the circulation and exert an oncotic pressure, keeping the fluid in the plasma space. The most commonly prescribed of these is gelifusin. However, these have little, little place in clinical practice as they have not been shown to be any more effective than crystalloids, and they do carry some additional risk, such as the risk of anaphylaxis. Having said this, many people still use them for resuscitation fluids and you might find your consultant or registrar prescribing them. Having set colloids to one side, let's take a look at the content of some crystalloids. Here we have a table showing the electrolyte composition of different types of fluid and how that compares to the plasma. We can see from this table that our surgical 2.5 litres of Hartmann's would give the patient 327 millimoles of sodium, 277 millimoles of chloride and 12.5 millimoles of potassium. This amount of sodium and chloride can cause problems um, such as decreased renal perfusion and in the case of the chloride, hyperchloremic acidosis. So what should we give? Well, if we take our standard 75 kilogram man again and assume that his using is in norm or normal and that he doesn't have any pathology affecting him currently, then the best plan would be to prescribe one bag of 500 mils of 0.18% saline with 4% dextrose, and then four further bags of the same, but with 20 millimoles of potassium added. This would give your patient uh, 77 millimoles of sodium and chloride, and 80 millimoles of potassium, which works out to be about right. 
This fluid is not available, however, in a lot of areas in Aberdeen, and it should not be given to patients who are hyponatremic, as it can exacerbate this. An alternative plan, if you can't get this, is to prescribe one 500 ml bag of Hartmann's and four 500 ml bags of 5% dextrose with 20 millimoles of potassium in it. We're now going to talk a bit about replacement fluids. Replacement fluids are required if you think the patient is dehydrated, but otherwise well. There are several different ways of replacing fluids. The simplest one is by encouraging oral intake. This is particularly useful in patients who perhaps have dementia and just don't remember to drink when they're thirsty. If this is not possible, you can give them an additional IV fluid top up on top of their oral fluid. And this is quite a good strategy in frail old ladies on um, the orthopaedic trauma ward who've had their hip replaced. The last option is to replace it all IV. In general, you should aim to replace the deficit over roughly the same time frame that it occurred over. The tricky bit is working out how much they've actually lost, and this is really impossible to cal calculate accurately, as nobody keeps an accurate fluid balance at home. This means you need to make an educated guess, which is very difficult. It takes practice, and you will eventually get better at this with time. If we need to replace fluids, then it's important to think of where the fluid is being lost from. If it's through vomiting or high GI loss, then there's liable to be a large amount of electrolyte loss as well as fluid loss. This means you need to replace um, these losses with a, a balanced crystalloid such as Hartmann's. In the case of vomiting, there's a risk of your patient becoming hypochloremic due to the loss of hydrochloric acid in the vomit. In these patients, it's OK and even preferable to replace their losses with 0.9% saline. The last type of IV fluids that we prescribe is resuscitation fluid. This is for patients who are shocked and hypotensive. Patients needing resuscitation fluid should get a, a balanced crystalloid, such as Hartmann's, as a bolus of up to 20 to 30 mils per kilogram, and then urgent reassessment after each bolus. It's the last part of this that's the most important bit. There's no point in giving the bolus and then leaving to do something else on the ward. The patient should be reviewed immediately after the fluid has gone through to assess for a result. The only time that anything other than a balanced crystalloid should really be used for resuscitation fluid is if the patient is bleeding, in which case blood is the best thing to give. When we prescribe fluids, we need to think about how and when we prescribe them. Ideally, they should be prescribed on the ward round with senior input from consultants. But in the real world, unfortunately, this doesn't happen. You will regularly see fluids being prescribed as hourly. This should be avoided as it is inaccurate. And instead, fluid should all be prescribed in mils per hour and administered via a fluid pump. We can also adapt the time frame that we give the fluids over to the individual patient. Rather than prescribing the fluid to run continuously for 24 hours, we can increase the rate so the patient will get the same volume over a shorter time period. This means that they're not attached to a drip and makes things like physiotherapy and mobility and just their general quality of um, life in hospital better. Hopefully from this podcast you'll have learned that fluid prescribing is not easy and should not be done without a detailed assessment of the patient. I'll finish now by talking about one of my own fluid bugbears. This is that when you start working, one of the most annoying jobs that you'll have is prescribing fluids to patients at night. You walk onto the ward and the nurse hands you a stack of fluid prescriptions for patients that you've never seen before and you probably will never see again. This means you have to go and find out why the patient is on fluids, find out what their ins and outs have been for the day, find out their comorbidities and finally examine the patient. 
All of this takes a lot of time to do properly and gets rushed when you have several wards of patients to look after. The best way to avoid this happening is to ensure that all patients who are getting fluids overnight have enough to last for the whole night, unless there's a specific reason that you're wanting them to be reviewed. This means that your patients get a personalised fluid prescription from someone who knows them and your colleagues on the night shift will forever be your friends. That concludes our podcast on fluid prescribing. Hopefully by now you'll be able to talk about the distribution of fluid within the body. You'll be able to describe the basic daily requirements that a patient has for fluid and electrolytes talk about how you would assess the fluid status of a patient and talk a bit about the different types of fluid that you could prescribe. I also hope that you'll have taken away how complex fluid prescribing is and understand that it takes a lot of thought and practice to do properly. Finally, I think the most important message about fluids, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, is that the by far the best and safest way of getting fluids into your patients is by enabling them to drink for themselves. If you've got any questions about fluids, then feel free to ask them um, during your fluids therapy tutorial. Um, also, any of the consultants um, on the anaesthetic or ITU blocks will be more than happy to, to help. Thank you very much.